So the big question is what's going to happen to RFS, so re renewable fuel standards for 2017 untouched. 2018 is now at the White House. What do you expect? You know, we don't expect any changes. I think the EPA understands the importance of the program and the administrator, new administrator also understands the importance of the program. And he has committed to follow the law and the law says 15 billion gallons and that's what we think we're going to get out of this next program for next year. So when things get derailed in D.C., like what's happened between uh, Russia and the U.S. and Comey and Trump overnight, do you wake up and read those headlines and say, whew, he's not going to care about ethanol today? Or do you just sort of ignore them and go on your business? No, look, I think right now, and from a policy standpoint, we are in one of the best places we've been in years, right? There's a big support for the uh, renewable fuel standard following the law. We've got expanded blends. We have the RVO that's being looked at by the EPA as well. The first time that they're saying, yeah, you know what, we need to have more E15 in the market. How do we sell it year round? So I think from our standpoint, the stuff that happens on a daily basis politically, we think we have broad support across the administration for the long term, and that's what we're focused on. There is some uh, doubt, though, that we've had the RFS wind up growing, say, 6 to 7 percent a year in 2016, 2017. There are concerns now that under Scott Pruitt, that's going to be more like 2 to 3 percent growth. How does that material affect your business? Now, where we're at, statutorily, by law, 15 billion gallons was the program. Now, the whole program is 27 billion. From what, but what we do, corn-based corn conventional ethanol, that program is set. We don't believe that that'll go any higher from a from a uh, standpoint of the standard. Now, could we break through that? We are starting to break through the 10% blend. While a lot of people said we couldn't do that, we're doing that through E15, 15% ethanol, and actually more E85 sales are, are taking place across the U.S. as well. So that's where we're breaking down. It's not the statutory limit. Actually, we're going full market-based uh, economics that we're driving demand right now. And the other issue that uh, wraps in the Trump administration is Carl Icahn. So uh, he obviously is an investor in a refinery. Uh, basically, you have refiners having to pay certain credits to meet uh, EPA rules, and he wants to move that cost from refiners uh, to fuel blenders. How does that affect you? You know, from our standpoint, there's a few refiners that want to do that, but the bigger, broader coalition that's in place is, is large refiners, convenience stores, even UPS is saying don't move the standard. Small trucking companies don't move the, don't move the point of obligation. So you have this, a few people that are looking for some relief, but in general, the program has worked. It works very well. And the point of obligation, changing it at any point now can wreak havoc on the markets. And I think the administration understands that. The last time they even started talking about it, 10 or 12 markets moved around the world just on discussion of that. And I think they're highly sensitive to understanding, yeah, we might have to give some relief to these mid-continent refiners who have these obligations or these small refiners. But last year, the EPA issued 23 waivers to small refiners that to give them relief on their cost of the RIN program. So you can get relief. It yeah, doesn't but Valero, have to... CVR, the ones that ICON's involved with, they're not small. That's the problem, right? So, and ICON doesn't back down from anything. I mean, just take a look at what happened over Herbalife. So, in theory, though, if you do see a movement towards changing the point of obligation, literally, how does that affect you? Does that mean that you're going to look at less ethanol demand, you, where you're going to scale down? What does that mean for you? If it were to happen, which we actually don't think it's going to happen on a broad front, but if it were to happen, it would probably happen in, in concert with other things that happen. Maybe give us E15 year round, because we really have to drive demand. But our customers don't want it, and I don't believe that really anytime soon the point of obligation is going to get changed. So, But if it does, it means basically you think it's a horse trade, that we'll give you more E15, so you basically blending more uh, ethanol with gasoline in order to make up for the fact that we're changing the point of obligation. Yeah, if it were to move from our standpoint, the, the ethanol demand is set around the world at this point. I mean, we continue to grow and grow our demand globally. We have exporting more ethanol than we ever have before. Demand in the U.S. is better than it ever has been, been before. But it just wreaks havoc on the paperwork and the administrative effect of that. I just, from our standpoint, if it were to change, minimal impact on green plains in general, but a big broader impact on many, many parties in the constituency. Uh, in terms of exports, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Brazil is considering a tariff uh, import tax from uh, ethanol here in the U.S. What do you think about that? Well, I think what we saw yesterday is they realized that any kind of big import tax that they would put on would be met with something from the U.S. So don't forget, they, they export ethanol to us, they export meat to us, they want to export their corn. They have massive amounts of corn this year, and they need to find a market. And they're very afraid that they would have a retaliatory effect if, if they put a, a, a tax going into Brazil. So what they did yesterday even was to say, listen, we at least want to have an even playing field. If you bring ethanol and you have to hold it longer than you might normally have held it, that's just satisfying some of the internal guys in Brazil. But in general, I think they punted that one down the road. Uh, how much of your uh, overall production do you wind up exporting for ethanol? Last quarter, we exported actually around 20 percent of our, of our production, and we only produce about 8 percent of the U.S. production. Huh. And where's it going? 
It's going all over the world. I mean, we have places but like mostly. Brazil was our biggest customer last quarter, but we even are exporting to the Philippines, to India. Europe's opening up again. We have places all over Central America and South America. Even Oman is opening up again. So our markets, we're going to export somewhere between 1.1 and 1.3 billion gallons of ethanol this year. It's one of the biggest years we've ever had. Last quarter was the biggest quarter we've ever had. And it's all about cheap octane and clean air. And we're seeing these initiatives around the world. And they're not just mandates. It's actually market-driven initiatives to say, we want to buy your octane. And that's, that's resonating with the EPA today. They understand the importance of octane with some of the bigger automakers, and they want to have higher octane fuels to meet CAFE standards, and I All think right. that's where they're going to be focused.